Welcome to American Dreams, Keys to Success, with your host, Alan Olson. I'm here today with Congressman Mike Conway, and uh, Mike, enjoy having you here on, on today's show. Well, Alan, thanks for having me here. I'm uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So, a little background, I guess, kind of uh, introducing the... Uh, the listeners to your unique background. You used to work with uh, George Bush. I did. Uh, George and I were business partners in the oil business for uh, for five years in uh, in middle of Texas. Great experience. Uh, he's a uh, terrific guy. Uh, I wish I'd have been partners with him in the baseball team. I'd have made a lot more money. But uh, <laughs> now he's uh, he's a terrific guy and a, and a good, warm uh, human being. Uh, you know, what you see is uh, what you get. I mean, he's not a lot of, of uh, subterfuge there. He's a straightforward guy and uh, and a terrific uh, boss. So you've uh, you entered Congress in which year? Uh, two thousand five. Two thousand five. So and, I'm starting my uh, fifth term. And uh, what what role are you currently playing? Well, I've got uh, I wear several hats. Uh, one, I'm chairman of the Ethics Committee, the House Ethics Committee, which is a full committee. Uh, I'm also subcommittee chairman of the uh, largest subcommittee on House uh, on the House Agriculture Committee, the General Farm Commodities and uh, and Risk Management Subcommittee. So I chair that. Uh, chief, De- I'm, a, I'm a deputy whip. Uh, on the whip uh, team and, and a deputy whip, as well as uh, I've got a, a couple of other roles, but uh, those are the main ones I run. I do. Mike, what what would you say is the most essential quality in leadership today? Um, certainly integrity, and um, uh, just being able to have a have a vision for where you want to go, and uh, strength of purpose to uh, to know that you're doing the right thing, and then be able to stick with that. I think the country is uh, screaming for leadership today. Uh, we're hungry for it, and uh, we're not getting it, quite frankly, from the White House. And obviously, that's the most important leader we have in this country is the President of the United States. And and uh, he should be, since he doesn't face re-election again, he really ought to be uh, focused more on leading this country where we ought to go as opposed to worrying about the 2014 election. As head of the Ethics Committee, how do you see that the integrity is enforced? Well, it's a uh, complaint-driven system, much like the uh, State Board of Accountancy is here in California and in, in other places. So we deal with the complaints that come up. We can generate those complaints ourselves, uh, the Ethics Committee can, or we can get them from other members of the House. Um, and it's a uh, slow, tedious process, as are all uh, judicial-like processes. You want to protect the innocent. You want to make sure that everyone has due process, and that due process is lengthy and time-consuming. You know, the court of public opinion, which uh, uh, most of us get judged on, is almost instantaneous. Uh, there are no defense lawyers and there are no standards for evidence. So you've got the court of public opinion running. And at the same time, we're trying to run an ethics investigation that uh, has to give uh, you know, proper due diligence and those kind of things to the uh, to the accused and uh, and to the folks who make the complaint. So uh, but it works. Um, the committee is the only 50 uh, 50 split committee in, in Congress. So the ranking member and I uh, have to agree on most everything to make something move forward. Uh, and, in, and the votes um, have to be, uh, you have to have at least one person from the other party uh, vote to move an investigation forward. So you can't have a partisan witch hunt, so to speak. And I'm quite proud of what we did the last two years before I became chairman in that uh, every vote was uh, unanimous uh, on the committee to move all the investigations, to take all the actions that we were taking. And so uh, it works, but it's, uh, it's slow, agonizingly slow. But uh, it's important that we protect the innocent uh, as well as give the uh, uh, the accused a uh, you know a fair day. Should the citizens be concerned with what's happening in the world? Today? Well, <laughs> yes. Short answer. Okay. Uh, whether you want to narrow that down a little bit to and let's, uh, let's, what's let's going bring on this with back DC. to currently what what's going on within the government. Within I, I'm going to I'm going to narrow this back down to the Constitution. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the, the balance. Well, let me of, let me answer it this way. Um, just to kind of set the backdrop in the in the uh, the stage for, uh, for the conversation, uh, we currently have. If you project the promises, the, the financial promises that we made to each other with Social Security, Medicare, interest on the national debt, all of those things that we've committed to now, just basically promises to each other over the next seventy five years, what that costs. You then discount that to today's present value. It's seventy one trillion dollars of present value of future promises that we've made to each other. It's unsustainable and affordable. I mean, you'd need $71 trillion in the bank today to be able to pay that off and uh, you know, on, a, on a proper basis. So it's unsustainable, and, uh, and that ought to concern every single American. Now, it doesn't because it doesn't touch our quiet lives. 
people all over America got up today. They, you know, trying to go to work, get the kids off to school. One of them was sick. They got to find a doctor's appointment, and the car wouldn't start because the battery's dead. You know, life. Mm -hmm. But this pending fiscal wreck that, that many of us see doesn't touch our daily quiet lives. And as a result it, of that, will it ever touch it, your life? March first. March first. It'll start. Yeah, March first. And this is a sequester. Sequester. That's right. When that kicks in, now it won't happen immediately because some of the furloughing and the layoffs and those things will begin to build over time. But beginning March first, a sequestration kicks in, and uh, at that point in time, there will be quiet lives uh, disrupted. And hopefully the American people get said, now why is this happening and what's the result and what are Republicans trying to get done with this uh, uh, forced cut to the, uh, to the budget? Mike, I need to take a quick break. We'll sure. be right back after these messages. And when we get back, I want to talk more about the sequestering coming up. Good. Thank you. With current laws, we have left our children an enormous financial burden. Even though they may be too young to understand it. At GroCo, we care about you and the ones you love and the quality of your and their lives. Call us today to see how we can help. 877-CPA-2006. GroCo, helping you along the way. Apple pie, baseball, and now here's All-American Alan Olson. Welcome back. I'm here today with Congressman Conaway. And uh, before the break, we're talking about... Uh, What's going on in Congress uh, or Washington, D.C. right now with the upcoming sequestering sure. and how it will affect our lives. And I, I want to pick up on this. Now, I'm reading in the paper today that Obama, President Obama has the upper hand. What, what's this all about, upper hand? Well, I'm not sure he does. Um, uh, the sequester it relates to the Budget Control Act of 2011. As a part of that, the, the president insisted that we insert a sequester mechanism uh, to, uh, to enforce the spending cuts that, uh, that were agreed to. We agreed to a $1.2 trillion increase in the debt ceiling, but a company that had to be a $1.2 trillion reduction in the deficit. And if the super committee couldn't work, which they wound up not being able to work, then sequestration kicked in and automatic across the board cuts were to be implemented. And this was the president's idea. And so I'm not sure where the upper hand thing comes from. Because yeah, that's, I, I heard that it was his his role to put the uh, sequestering. His idea, in. and and uh, he's got the upper hand in the sense that he has to implement it. Office of Management Budgets is charged with the implementation of the sequester. The sequester is a 10 year number. Or the 1.2 trillion is over 10 years. The uh, the idea was to to get the 1.2 trillion off of 100 percent of the budget. Uh, sequester pulls that 1.2 out of a much a, a much narrower band. Sequestration, I mean, uh, discretionary spending, uh, plus a little bit on the uh, uh, on the mandatory side. But it's a it's a mess. Um, the numbers are not as dramatic as you would think, though. The sequestration for fiscal 2013, which the Senate insisted be uh, instead of starting May, uh, April, uh, excuse me, January one. The Senate insisted that that be kicked to March 1. So we've got seven months in which to get a year's worth of cuts in. So you've, you've exacerbated the issue a little bit. It's about $85 billion total. And the total spending is, is running right now at, at uh, $1.04 trillion. So it's something less than a 10% cut. Uh, and even if you annualize it from the, uh, from the seven months, it's still not a disaster that it should be. Would, and, you, uh, would you agree, though, there's a lot of fat that can be cut oh, out of sure. spending? Absolutely. But what you've seen the president do as an example, as he's done with the Department of Ag, he's communicated to all the executive branch agencies, sent out the worst, scariest stories you can as to what the impact sequestration will have. And so in the, as it relates to House Agriculture, I mean, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Secretary Vilsack has said he's going to furlough the meat inspectors. Well, you can't sell meat in this country unless it's been inspected. So... What he's arguing is that uh, you know, inspecting meat is less important than some of the other things that uh, uh, that, that USDA is doing. So uh, the, you'll see these stories this coming week and, and then during March. Uh, I, su I suspect the president will scour the country looking for our families and others who've been impacted negatively by sequestration. And he'll have them in the front of the cameras and trying to persuade the American people to try to bully Congress or bully the House into uh, unwinding the sequestration. And it's, it's not going to get unwound. Now, it can be substituted. We can find better, rational, more thoughtful cuts to spending uh, and, and substitute those for the across-the-board cuts. Across-the-board cuts are, mi are mindless. They're very unthoughtful. Uh, they leave 90% of the bad programs, the fat you're talking about, the waste in place. They cut 10% off the good programs that you shouldn't cut at all. So it's not the best way to run a government, but we are so frustrated with this president, this uh, Senate, uh, in not wanting to deal with spending at all that we're willing to let these bad cuts go into effect just to get their attention and try to drag them to the table. 
when you, be the president of the Senate. When you think about this, um, why do you think it's important for a society to live within its means, which you seem to have got up? Well, track. we have for the last 40 years, and there's plenty of blame to go around. It's, it's not a Republican wreck or a Democrat. It's all of us. We are all complicit in the $71 trillion in unfunded promises, the six, 16, almost $17 trillion now uh, in hard debt. What that says is we've had an inability to take care of today's problems with today's resources. It's much, far much easier to take care of today's resources with tomorrow's, I mean, today's problems with tomorrow's resources, i.e. the $17 trillion we've borrowed just to, to fund our normal operations, which no business or family would ever you know, do on any kind of a scale at, uh, over a long period of time. And I got to so, gotta slip one of the questions sure. here. Uh, the statutory pay raise is 2013. Why did you vote to eliminate the statutory pay adjustment for the federal government? We're going to have a trillion dollars in deficits. And the president's pandering. He, he's, he's a master at this, by the way. Uh, as soon as he announced that pay raise, it was for all federal employees. It wasn't just members of Congress, but it was all federal employees. The media immediately went to the fact that it gave races to the senators and congressmen. Our phones lit up. People were so mad at me, they thought I had done it. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't lobby for that pay raise. It's 800 bucks. Uh, you know, nice chunk of change, I, get, I agree. Uh, but we didn't lobby for it. But the president knew if he, made the, if he did it, the, the backlash would be against Congress for, for being a part of it. And he did the, the pay raise. So uh, now's not a time to raise uh, pay raises. If you Congress, so we need to take a quick break. We'll sure. be right back after this. Right. He's the world's most trustworthy man. Tax filing deadlines are scheduled around his vacation calendar. The IRS agent who audited his client apologized. <laughs> I don't always advise people on their taxes, but when I do, I save them every penny legally possible. Groco CPAs and Advisors. Come to Groco and stay wealthy, my friend. Apple pie, baseball, and now here's All-American Alan Olson. Welcome back. I'm here today with Congress Conaway from Texas, and uh, we've been visiting with uh, him on Congress and the upcoming sequestering, but I want to turn the page here. I want to get into gun control. Sure. Well, Texas right. guns. I mean, tell me what your what your stance is. Well, on this and yeah, thanks, Alan. The, the issue is gun violence, and and who's not against gun violence? I mean, we all are, but it's not inanimate objects that are the issue. It's mental health and the folks who would pick up a gun and do what these uh, mass murders have done. The fella in Connecticut had to be deranged. He had to be crazy. And, and I'm not a CPA. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And so I may be using those terms inartfully, but only a deranged, crazy person does what this fellow did. He had all the laws in place to say, don't do those. It's against the law to kill your mother. It's against the law to steal her guns. It's everything he did that was against the law already. And so it's really not inanimate objects. Um, the, most of the focus is on uh, scary looking weapons. It has nothing to do with the, the actions or, the, or the, the way these weapons shoot. They are still single shot uh, weapons, high capacity magazines. It's, you know, it's easy to understand, but it's not the issue. Second Amendment, the emphasis on the Second Amendment, which I think is hopefully a part of what we're talking about, is not a place for hunting. It's not a place for target practice or gun collecting even. It's in place because our founding fathers knew that an armed citizenry is less easy to enslave than an unarmed citizenry, and it's just as simple as that. Now that sounds a bit crazy uh, that uh, that you would worry about a tyrannical government doing something to you that you didn't want done or it didn't fit with under the Constitution. But the Second Amendment is there on purpose, and uh, and it protects us. It protects. Uh, it, it's one of those pillars on which our freedoms and foundations rest. And uh, and without it, we are not nearly as free or as safe uh, as uh, as with it. Now, yes, there's irresponsible use of guns. I got that. But I'm unwilling at this point to restrict a law-abiding citizens' ability to own weapons and firearms uh, just because there are a few people out there that are uh, misusing them and, and, uh, and, and we're not addressing the mental health issue, which is much harder. It's far easier to think you can, can, uh, can deal with an inanimate object than it is to deal with a real issue, which is, is mental health. It's a state-based problem. The resources apply to that um, and all those kind of things. The privacy issues associated with it are hard. I got that. But that's, the, that's where the real issue with gun violence is concerned. And, and so our Second Amendment is an important right that I'm, I'm unwilling to, uh, to try to impinge on because it's out of some sense of uh, false sense of safety and, uh, and to, uh, to take away that right uh, that our founding fathers, it would have never occurred to them in their right minds to disarm in front of the king. 
And quite frankly, their opposition to the king would look as crazy as our opposition to uh, to this government today. But it's uh, it's simply that I, I don't want to sound like a you know crazy berserko kind of person, but that's the truth. I mean, just quietly say, Second Amendment is there is uh, is to protect us from not only physical violence in our homes and, and uh, persons, but also against a government that would do something we. Uh, that doesn't fit within our Constitution. You know, I don't think under any other president compared, there's been more executive orders issued. Right. Uh, and so if the president issues an executive order on some type of gun control, how does Congress respond to that? Well, we don't respond very well because the House and the Senate, as a legislative uh, counterbalance to the executive, is only effective in concert. The House has no unilateral authority. And so whether it's using the power of the purse or other ways to get at these executive orders, unless we can get the Senate and Harry Reid to go along with it, which so far have been pretty hard to do because Harry's in league with this president, they're shoulder to shoulder on all these issues, uh, we're not very effective. We'll have to rely on the judiciary, quite frankly, to protect us because if he goes overreaches with an executive order, then there'll be lawsuits across this country filed uh, to push back on that. And at that point in time, we're stuck with uh, relying on the judiciary because of uh, the lack of getting the Senate to, uh, to agree on this stuff because they're not going to buck the president on anything. Uh, certainly not something as important as gun control. You know, I'm going to go back to your, your role as, as CPA going into Congress. Sure. Uh, how would you define ethics when you're looking at uh, your role in the ethics committee? Well, um, House Ethics, we have a code of conduct that's uh, statutorily in place that is, uh, describes how members are supposed to go. You've got your own personal codes that we have to rely on. We've got laws and rules and regulations that affect the way we raise money, the way that money gets spent, all those kind of things. And so uh, the ethics are doing your best to comply not only with the letter of these action, these rules and regulations, but also the spirit of it. Uh, you know, you can't write rules, regulations, and, uh, and laws so detailed that a, that a crafty person who wants to get around them can't find a way to try to get around them. So it's mainly, you know, the, the right attitude toward, uh, I want to do this job right, I want to do it in, a, in an upright, uh, worthy basis, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, com I'm going to comply with the spirit of whatever these rules are, in addition to working to, to, uh, to uh, comply very uh, specifically with the letter as well. So it's, uh, you know, it's an attitude of I'm going to, I'm going to keep the, I'm going to obey the rules and I'm going to try to, to insist that everybody on my team obeys the rules and we work at it. Now, if you have inadvertent mistakes, tax returns get filed from time to time that have a mistake in it. Did you breach your code of ethics? No, you just made a mistake. And so you un get it, fix it, take care of it and move, move like forward. Geithner. Well, maybe not that one, but, uh, <laughs> um, that, but intention, intent is, uh, is a big problem in that regard as well. So, uh, you know, part of our problem is that, um, we've blown every, uh, breach of conduct or of the rules, uh, into a, a, a out of biblical proportions. And there was, you know, there's no gradation in terms of mistakes. If you file, you make a mistake in your, um, honest mistake in your financial disclosure, that gets counted in the press as bad as if you had uh, taken a bribe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same kind of, the same penalty is on every single thing, and that really shouldn't be the case. Um, and so we're working to try to hold, hold members accountable. It's hard to do. You're sitting judgment at your peers, and, and uh, but it's important work. I spent seven and a half years on the State Board of Accountancy in Texas. Uh, so I've got some background in, in holding peers accountable for either behavioral issues or technical compliance, as, as you and I worked, uh, you worked on tax returns and audits and those kind of things. So I've got some background that, that I brought to this job in the House of, uh, of an exact same kind of a scenario. Is it getting harder to enforce the ethics out there? Um, no, because it's a voluntary compliance rule. And, and you know, most all members want to do the right thing, want to comply. You'll have a few that get off the reservation. Uh, Jesse Jackson, as an example, just pled guilty to stealing money from his campaign accounts. And so those are the exceptions rather than rules. Most everybody that we deal with are good-hearted. Their intent is to, to obey the rules, and they just get caught up in something and are and, uh, and certainly willing to make amends and, and, and fix it. But there's the bad apple, and they get all the press. They get all, and they taint the rest of it. So you've got 435 <clears throat> members of the House. So, uh, so most all of them are good folks, but the, the few bad apples uh, taint the rest of us. What's the difference between an ethical dilemma and a moral dilemma? Um, I don't know that there is a difference. Uh, our founding fathers knew that only a moral people could self-govern. Amoral people and immoral people cannot self-govern. And so we as a society are being less and less moral uh, as we develop, as we move forward. And, and as a result, you're seeing all these abuses, all these frauds, all these cheating and stealing and, and the things that are going on in society. That is not evidence of a moral society. 
And as those morale, as that morality continues to deteriorate, as the path we're on, uh, it will be a real strain as whether or not we can self-govern uh, under the ways that our founding fathers uh, wanted us to do. Democracies and republics last about 250 years. We're 237. I've been telling high school students last year during the campaign that when they are adults, 15, 20 years from now, when they are adults and the leading edge of running companies, running not-for-profits, running being in the government, those kind of stuff, uh, our country would be in uncharted territory with respect to the longevity of a republic and, uh, and, and, and whether or not we can hold it, it's going to be up to them. And only a moral people can hold this government together, and we are not on a path that says it will last much longer. Congressman Conaway, we appreciate you joining us on today's show. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. We'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to American Dreams with Alan Olson on AM 1220 KDOW. 